pretty much what we're seeing with a lot of these really successful cases with mental health is that there's nothing that has worked so far and people are desperate and they are willing to try a restrictive diet. You know, no one likes to restrict their diet. Everyone wants to eat whatever they like and just go out and about and be amongst friends and eat and drink. But when you have a serious medical condition that is metabolically based and a diet changes your metabolism and you're willing to try that, I mean, you're going to do it because you're desperate and other medications and other treatments just won't be as effective. Thank you so much for being here today, uh, for sharing your expertise, which is really an expansive expertise over a decade. I connected with both of you probably about a decade ago, and I consider you, both of you, uh, early adopters to the use of the ketogenic diet for expanding applications, but you have an early history in using the ketogenic diet as an evidence-based uh, clinical metabolic therapy, you know, with randomized controlled trials behind it, five or six, probably. So maybe you could uh, tell our listeners a little bit about what you do, your background in uh, dietary therapies, and uh, and how you got onto this track. I'll go first because uh, I'm older. Denise lets me go first, but uh, we actually have somewhat similar backgrounds, and we're both Midwesterners, and we're also good friends. But I started working with uh, ketogenic diet therapies over 30 years ago in a pediatric hospital here in Wisconsin. And, um, you know, it only took me one patient to get hooked on it because I saw an immediate change in that patient's cognitive abilities and seizure control within 24 hours of being in a state of ketosis. It was absolutely stunning to me. And um, I decided the day I saw that, that, that this was it. I'm going to do this because I had been kind of a jack of all trades nutritionist, uh, filling in for people and trying to work part time, raising a family. And then I thought, nope, this is it. I am going to stick with this. And, and I did. And, and I'm really glad I did because, uh, you know, not only had I worked now 20 years with epilepsy, um, I eventually left the hospital and went out on my own because I just felt I needed to uh, support other applications of it that I saw coming down the pipeline. People with epilepsy also have migraines. That was getting better. People with epilepsy also have depression. I saw that getting better. Uh, and so I just knew this, this was something really unique and special that I wanted to commit the rest of my career to. Um, so Denise, I'll let you take on. Yeah. And it's, it's funny you say that, that your first patient convinced you because the first few patients just scared me because I didn't know enough and I was trying to figure this out. And, and so, um, I'll make a long story short, but, um, I was first trying to get out of doing ketogenic therapies because I, um, wasn't comfortable, didn't really have a lot of training, hadn't met you yet and done any training. And so, um, we created a position at the hospital to, have it be an only ketogenic position. And, but that took about a year. And so by the time we got that done, I realized, oh my gosh, then I was seeing what you were seeing, Beth. And then I was seeing these kids getting better and better. And, and you see this with a lot of keto dietitians where they're either all in or all out because it's very demanding. It, there's a lot of, of work, usually a lot of extra time that people put in. And, and once they're sold, they're sold. So it's a lot of these, these late, mostly ladies, some gentlemen, that have been in working with keto, we've been doing it a long time. They've been doing it a long time. They stick around because as a dietitian, there's nothing we've ever done that's comparable to having the the, the medical benefits of of, um, of ketogenic therapies. So yeah, I did the same thing. I was I was at the hospital, um, the University of Michigan. It was great, great program, great growth, and helping a lot of people. But then Beth was over here saying, hey, you know, there, there are people with other conditions or people with cancer. Or there are people with um, you know, migraines, different conditions that need help. And the Charlie Foundation was supporting that. And, and so people started calling my office and I literally just um, kind of hung, hung a shingle out and started just because of need, just because people were asking for it. And it came to a, a point of saying, 
I either have to do one or the other. I really don't want two full-time jobs. And I ended up, you know, choosing to go the path where it was a little more unknown and a little more interesting because we knew, I knew that they would find someone else to take care of these kids with epilepsy, but what about these other conditions? And so it's been fun to do that. Yeah. I, Denise, I think it was around 2013, maybe about 10 years ago that you had reached out and you were, you said you were doing, working independently too, but I think you were still at Michigan at the time. And uh, yeah. And so, I mean, your background is using the ketogenic diet for its clinically evidence-based approved, you know, applications, but you were inspired because you knew from your experience that this had broader applications and um, through helping individuals. And then Beth, I know you were working with the Global Symposium. I think you actually responded back. We connected, you probably don't know it, but we connected in 2010. I think you approved like my abstract for Scotland, the Global Symposium, and then 2012 too. And also when I had a TEDx talk, you were my contact for the Charlie Foundation because I was seeking pictures of Jim and Charlie for my TEDx talk on the ketogenic diet. So you guys have been doing a lot of, uh, in addition to being in the trenches, a lot of advocacy uh, for the ketogenic diet outside of that. And that's kind of an important theme and kind of where I want to go is that specifically like you have experience with this diet and neurological disorders, neurometabolic disorders like glucose transporter type one deficiency, and also an emerging application uh, is neuropsychiatric disorders or psychiatric disorders. And I would love to hear sort of your experience with using the ketogenic diet outside of its, at this time, it's clinically accepted or approved applications beyond the standard of care and what your experience is with that. So it's very similar to the days when we were working with pediatric epilepsy before the randomized controlled trials. I see so many similarities. Everyone's questioning the therapy. Is it gonna give them heart disease? Where is the research? But what we're really hanging on to are case reports in early research, Ian Campbell's early research specifically for uh, bipolar um, disorders and schizophrenia, um, there's people that can't wait for the randomized controlled trials. And this is what Jim Abrams used to say about keto for epilepsy. The doctors were telling him, we don't have the science. We don't know the mechanism. We need to wait till we have the science. And Jim said, Jim Abrams of the Charlie Foundation, I should say, he's the executive director. If I had waited to start keto on Charlie when the science was available you know, it would be another 10 years and he would be much sicker than he already was. Um, Charlie was diagnosed with the worst kind of epilepsy. It was called Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. And it's simply a diagnosis of last resort. Like this kid has terrible seizures, multiple different types. We don't know the cause. He's got Lennox-Gastaut. Most of the kids end up in wheelchairs and with feeding tubes. And he was diagnosed by three specialists, by three epilepsy specialists. And so it wasn't a misdiagnosis, but keto saved him. And he was started on keto within um, a year of his diagnosis and uh, had an, an immediate response. And he was on the diet nearly five years, and now he's in his 30s. He's been off for 24 years and doesn't remember being on the diet because he was a little kid then has never had another seizure, has never taken a, a seizure medication. He was weaned off of his medications, actually, um, because he was seizure-free. So, I mean, that's, that's a home run, and there's no way that he could have waited. He had a, he had a really catastrophic-type epilepsy, and that's pretty much what we're seeing with a lot of these really successful cases with mental health, is that there's nothing that has worked so far and people are desperate, and they are willing to try a restrictive diet. You know, no one likes to restrict their diet. Everyone wants to eat whatever they like and, and uh, just go out and about and be amongst friends and eat and drink. But when you have a serious medical condition that is metabolically based and a diet 
changes your metabolism and you're willing to try that, I mean, you're going to do it because you're desperate um, and, and other medications and other treatments just won't be as effective. If you've heard me talk on other podcasts before, you know that I believe that tracking your glucose and optimizing your metabolic health is really the ultimate life hack. We know that cravings and mood instability and energy levels and weight are all tied to our blood sugar levels. And of course, all the downstream chronic diseases that are related to blood sugar are things that we can really greatly improve our chances of avoiding if we keep our blood sugar in a healthy and stable level throughout our lifetime. So I've been using CGM now on and off for the past four years since we started Levels, and I have learned so much about my diet and my health. I've learned the simple swaps that keep my blood sugar stable, like flax crackers instead of wheat-based crackers. I've learned which fruits work best for my blood sugar. Like I do really well with pears and apples and oranges and berries, but grapes seem to spike my blood sugar off the chart. I'm also a notorious night owl, and I've really learned with using Levels how if I get to bed at a reasonable hour and get good quality sleep, my blood sugar levels are so much better. And that has been so motivating for me on my health journey. It's also been helpful for me um, in terms of keeping my weight at a stable level uh, much more effortlessly than it has been in the past. So you can sign up for levels at levels.link slash health, get access to a continuous glucose monitor and the level software that helps you really uh, dial into a lot of these strategies for your life and your body. The question for both of you, is the ketogenic diet unique as a dietary therapy in that, I guess the question is, is there any other diet that one could implement that would produce these kinds of results? And that is a question I get a lot from medical students. And, you know, does it have to be this restrictive? Can we do a, a variation of different types of diets, a low carb diet, a ve would a vegan diet, I mean, it could could simply eliminating some of the potential triggers of a standard diet be causing, you know, some of the pathology and just the, the nature of the diet is that it's elimination diet. I mean, is, so could it be just restricting something or is it, do you believe, and you know, in the community generally, the consensus is that by changing your metabolic physiology, that's changing the neuropharmacology of your brain and other energy dependent mechanisms, you know, systemically throughout the body. So what's your opinion and what's your experience? Cause I don't necessarily want this to be completely about a ketogenic diet discussion because there's, you know, the low glycemic index diet and, and other variations that are not necessarily ketogenic and would like to hear your experience if at all with those diets. Well, I mean, I know there, so there's, I think, and I think about some piggyback on this, even with epilepsy, there's some proof that some people can just go off gluten even, and they may have gluten induced seizures. And so a lot of these cases, and then there's proof with ultra processed foods that were causing, you know, probably more depression and things. So I think absolutely there are a certain number of people that probably maybe don't, maybe they don't need to be on a full out ketogenic diet. Maybe they could first try going off gluten and then try and try cutting out processed foods and eating a, a more, just a whole food diet. And Beth has a, a handout at the Charlie foundation for that, a whole foods diet. It's kind of a precursor to ketogenic therapy to say, you know what, start here. So one, and I always tell people, if you can't do this and you don't want to work with me anyway, if you can't start here and start cutting those things out, um, then maybe you're not a good candidate just because it's too difficult. And two, maybe that's enough. That's how Hopkins came out with a modified Atkins diet because they sent someone home and said, hey, come back on carbs and we'll bring you in to start keto in a month or two. I don't know the exact time frame. And by the time this child came in to start ketogenic therapy, they were already seizure free or almost seizure free. You know, they had such a dramatic difference. And so do we need full out keto for everybody? You know, maybe not, but also, you know, we, we tend what the people I run into, and I think probably similar with Beth are people that have been working on trying to do keto. And by time, this is different. 10 years ago, the people that came said, I don't know anything about ketogenic diet, please help me. And we would start them at square one. 
with the whole food diet and work them on to keto. Now they come in, they say, well, I've been doing keto for three or four months and I'm not getting anywhere. And my ketones are only 0.5. And, and my A1C is, I mean, people come in so much more educated in just the past few years, probably because of you know what you've done and the different educators and people have done and putting out content. And so they're coming in at a different level for us. But to answer, and Beth can piggyback on this, but to answer your question, no, does everybody need full out keto? And what also makes me hopeful is, can we put some of these people on keto for six months, a year, maybe longer, two years, and get them in just the best state they can be? And then can they then can they live on a low glycemic index diet, maybe, and, and not have to be in full ketosis, but just eat a really healthy whole food diet? You know, maybe maybe we can go there and not have to go so deep. And that's what I really hope, because, you know, if you tell someone you have to do this the rest of your life, that's that's tough. That's discouraging. But if we can say, wow, maybe we can treat you for a period of time. And we don't, we don't have proof of this yet. We just, we just kind of hope. But go, go ahead, Beth. I want to hear. Yeah, definitely. Gluten, I think, is a big one. And there are some case studies out of the UK showing um, people before a gluten-free diet um, and then after looking at their, um, their EEGs, and seizures, and um, there's some reports for uh, epilepsy, and there's some for migraine. And we know that gluten can be inflammatory, so that's one to cut out before going ketogenic. But also, we know B12 uh, deficiency could be a causal causal for um, depression, vitamin D deficiency. So there's key nutrients that. Um, could be looked at first, but those are things that often come into the diet once people get off of processed foods and start eating real foods. They tend to be getting more uh, eggs, high in B12. Um, we encourage them to get out and get vitamin D sunshine, but they can get vitamin D from foods as well. Uh, mushrooms, for example, is one a vegetable that's high in vitamin D um, and some fortified uh, foods. But I personally, and I know Denise does this too, we start people on a, um, a high quality supplement with keto just in case, you know, and in the beginning, they may not be getting a great variety of foods and we don't want to hound them about getting all of their green vegetables in when they're just learning keto. It's more important that they understand, you know, the macronutrients and what carbs are. Um, oftentimes people don't realize there's carbohydrates hidden in foods that are processed. So that kind of education kind of precedes the quality of the diet, which, which we work on later um, once they kind of get comfortable and get into a space where their brain is functioning a little bit better. So, um, yes, there are very, there's different variations of the diet. And as Denise said, the new hybrid diets were discovered based on the fact that people were observing their patients getting better in low ketosis. And we don't have to do this classic three to one or four to one diet that's 90% fat and is quite constipating. We can get away with something quite a bit lower in fat, still high fat, still fat as a main source of calories, or introduce intermittent fasting or ketone supplements. Or if you've got some extra fat in your body, that counts as ketones too. So we're recognizing that there's different ways to get into ketosis and you know, one of the things that we are experts in is really working with individuals to figure out what works best for them. Because in the end, people will follow a diet longer when it's personalized, right? When it works for their culture, their um, home situation, their support system. And I have people on all kinds of variations of keto. I've, I've done keto for vegetarians. I've done keto for carnitarians and paleo. And, and they work, but um, they each have little uh, nuances that make them work, such as supplementation or following certain labs. And if they are uh, void of red meats, for example, and we're maybe worried about iron, if it's a, if it's a woman um, who's menstruating. So there's lots of these variations and nutrients to be possibly concerned about. Um, and follow-up is really important. To, to make sure those are all working. Because 
for most people, a strict keto diet is temporary. And it seems to be, no, no research has yet to prove this, it seems to be if we can get people in a good state of ketosis where their symptoms are mitigated, then they can relax later on. And that certainly is true for epilepsy. In fact, children with epilepsy actually come completely off the diet and maintain their seizure control forever. Um, same, I've seen that with migraines. Now with mental health, I believe and I have seen that they have to maintain some type of lower carb, uh, maybe really low degree of ketosis, but certainly uh, it seems like um, they don't have to maintain high ketosis like we like them to get in, in in the initial months of sort of my, I call it the healing phase. So I'd like to come back to the gluten issue again, uh, maybe, but before, before I do that, because we're kind of on this theme of variations of the ketogenic diet, it may come to surprise our listeners that a ketogenic diet can be implemented uh, with a carnivore approach <laughs> and also a vegan approach. I know recently uh, Dane Harwood had e emailed me about that she follows a vegan ketogenic diet and wrote a book about uh, birth of a new brain healing from, uh, I think, postpartum bipolar disorder she had. So, and I'm just getting into that book now and trying to understand the vegan approach, but uh, the use of a plant-based vegan ketogenic diet and all being inundated with so many questions about that inspired me to write the first blog of Keto Nutrition, actually, which is a plant-based ketogenic diet approach and if it's even feasible. So, uh, so do you have, you had mentioned a vegetarian ketogenic diet approach in some of your patients. Have you had any patients have success with a vegan ketogenic diet? Because I get quite a few cancer patients that think a plant-based approach would be good and, and if that could be done in a, a ketogenic way. Uh, so I know I get so many questions about this, so I'd love to hear your input and feedback on that. Yeah, I mean, we, we do that pretty regularly. I mean, not, not so often, but I mean, often enough. And, and from the beginning, I remember the first time I had a vegan patient come up, I probably called Beth and, <laughs> and Beth said, Hey, you need to use a lot more MCT oil so we can allow more carbohydrates because a, a typical MCT diet would have um, 50, 60% MCT oil. And you could allow the ratio or the macronutrient content of that diet to have a much higher carbohydrate content. So on a vegan diet, we have to get plant-based proteins in, and that's going to come along with carbs. So we, we, we just supplement that usually using a lot of MCT oil. And we haven't, I haven't tried to do that without MCT. I think it would be very difficult, but yeah, I mean, perhaps it could be done. I just haven't tried it. We just tend with, it's a tool we have, so we, we use it. Yeah. So, uh, the plant protein would then be, there's commercially available like pea protein powder and, and other things. And I know, um, you know, some advocates of carnivore diets would say that these are, can be problematic and eliminating them in some patients is, is can be very helpful and beneficial. Uh, and maybe I do kind of well off plants and nuts and uh, nuts in moderation, I guess. Um, uh, but I, there's two things that I want to kind of circle back on is gluten. And it, it sounds to me, Beth, that you were saying that patients do much better uh, eliminating gluten. And these are not necessarily patients that have been diagnosed with celiac disease. So they are maybe, as I suspected, you know, there's probably a spectrum <laughs> of sensitivity to gluten and you may not be necessarily uh, or other things that are in wheat like gliadin and maybe some other things that could impact intestinal permeability and cause an inflammatory response. Uh, but your experience with uh, two things, eliminating gluten and also another question I get quite frequently is casein or milk protein. And if that becomes beneficial, uh, because so the early ketogenic diets were based on dairy fat and dairy protein. So would like to get your feedback on those two. Yeah, so first let's start with gluten. Uh, I wonder if eliminating gluten is also eliminating a lot of glyphosate, um, which is the weed killer, the chemical in the weed killer, right, that is um, commonly used in, in the U.S. here. 
Um, and just as an aside, uh, a lot of friends and family who travel to Europe who, who have identified that they're sensitive to gluten but don't have celiac disease, um, but then go to Europe and have a croissant or something and say, to bother me. So you wonder also about the hybrid version that we have in our country. Um, but yes, the, going back to uh, eliminating it, um, you, you really don't know if you're sensitive to it unless you do a trial of eliminating it. You really have to do at least two weeks. Um, and uh, wheat gluten is in many foods, not only wheat, but uh, maltodextrin, which might be an ingredient in even uh, soy sauce and lots of uh, flavorings and processed foods. So if you want to do a true elimination, you want to get a good list of um, gluten in there. And there's quite a few on the internet because it's pretty common that people will eliminate this just as a trial. If they have GI distress and they're um, you know, looking for ways to eliminate that, Casein is another one that people can be really sensitive to. And so I do a trial of gluten-free first and then gluten-free, casein-free. Um, so the whey protein is okay, but we can eliminate the casein um, by eliminating dairy products, pretty much using a whey protein powder if, if you so desire to use a protein powder. And there's other protein powders that could be used as well. But um, yeah, these are two that I say, listen, let's, especially if you have gut issues and nearly every adult I work with has comes to me with gut issues, which tends to be our first topic is let's, let's work on your microbiome first before we do this introduction to keto, because um, it'll help you adjust for one thing. But, um, you know, we, we know so much about the microbiome now, not, not as much as we need to, but we know that what we feed into our guts definitely affects the microbiome, and the microbiome is where most of our neurotransmitters are produced and is our immune system. And, you know, you want to really treat your gut well so that your, your brain functions and the rest of your body functions too. So I'm, I'm getting off on a tangent here. But I do suggest an elimination diet of first gluten-free and then possibly casein-free. And Denise alluded to uh, uh, an education piece that I wrote called Pre-Keto. It's gluten-free, whole foods, healthy fat, um, low carb, of course, not intended to do, induce ketosis. It's basically like a low glycemic index treatment, but there's some more guidance as to, you know, what types of foods you should include or could include and what you should eliminate. Um, and I, and I, want people to try that first before they go to keto because it is easier. It's, it's much easier to be out and about and select things from restaurants, for example, um, than going keto, which is much more of an elimination diet, as you said. Um, you know, you're, you're really limiting yourself to a smaller class of foods and limiting Portion sizes is, is the main thing that, that people have to understand. Your portion sizes of not only carb, but even protein. And the portion sizes of that, like people aren't used to putting oil, uh, olive oil, I should say, extra virgin olive oil on their food. And that's something you have to do if you're going to be keto. You, you literally have to put oil on your food to get to the high fat content. And your comment about um, the classic ketogenic diet 100 years ago, um, heavy cream was part of the classic ketogenic diet. Um, and so heavy cream is very rich in fat, low in carbohydrate, low in protein. I have worked with kids who had lactose intolerance who could tolerate heavy cream just fine. There's very little lactose in it. But I never gave it to a kid that had a dairy allergy because there is some dairy protein in it. So, yeah. And I want to say the heavy cream 100 years ago was probably quite a bit healthier than the cream that we're getting these days, right? So those things probably came into play, too, is that there's a lot people didn't have the degree of food allergies and food sensitivities that we see now. Do you see that? And both of you treat some patients with autism. Right. And with the casein, I think there's a case report too, isn't there a casein free and dairy free 
uh, response. And I remember, I think that was presented in Scotland in 2012, uh, that, and Beth, weren't you part of that or? Yeah, I, mm -hmm, that was, um, uh, a doctor from Florida who's a pediatrician and, and her daughter, it was the case. And, um, she had her on a casein free, gluten free diet. And then I worked with her and made that into a keto diet. And that child, uh, became completely seizure free and she came off the autism spectrum. Yet, uh, I'm in touch with her once in a while. She's written, that doctor has written a book on autism and diet, and she doesn't exclusively use keto for her patients, but she's been more supportive of keto after her daughter had such a great response. Yeah, but you know what? When we use, when we use classic keto, it's gluten-free. Just by the nature of anything with gluten is going to have carbs. So we never said gluten-free keto. We just said keto, classic keto, and it was gluten-free. Um, but it was, certainly wasn't dairy free, but you know, we, we often made the dairy, uh, elimination for kids with, uh, protein, dairy protein allergies, which is, you know, not that uncommon. I, I think too, just to add to that though, is cause people sometimes wonder, do I have to do that? And I, you know, I don't, I don't do it as a rule and I don't know, you know, exactly what you do, Beth, but I don't do it as a rule with those, with those restrictions, but I just, um, was speaking to someone today and she's using some of the zero carb tortillas, you know, allegedly let's put in quotes, zero carb tortillas. And she loves it. They taste great. But the, the concern is one, you're probably getting even more gluten in those is my thought because of the content. Um, and do they cause any issues and are they lowering your ketones? So, so now with a lot of these low carb products, sometimes keto be, can, can become very high gluten or much higher gluten than we would ever expect um, 10 years ago. So we, we really, you know, the processed foods are always something we're trying to say, man, either, either don't or limit them, limit them, watch your ketones, et cetera. And then personally with dairy, I, I really let people, unless there's an issue, I let them kind of make their own decision on dairy because it can be very difficult to take, you know, what you take and some things away, then you take now their dairy away. So I don't, it's not something I tend to do at the start unless we feel like there's just some reason for it because it can be really difficult. Um, but again, it just depends. But if they had autism, that would be a, a reason why I would say, oh yeah. And then a lot of times the parents, they come in with that. They've already been doing that. They've already been cutting out the dairy and, and so, and, and the um, gluten. So yeah, it's pretty common about fermented dairy not necessarily yogurt but i have like a cup of sour cream just to like get i'm usually like calorie calorie deficient by the end of the day <laughs> and i kind of like fat load at night with like a keto mousse kind of thing and uh i'm mildly dairy like if i drink if i have like cottage cheese or yogurt I'm, i get very stuffy but if i have a quality uh fermented dairy uh sour cream i don't have that dairy response uh, and I know, you know, sour cream is mostly fat. And I think, I don't know if because it's fermented or just because of the, the nature of it just being very low in dairy protein, if that's the case. But when we talk about dairy free, uh, I feel like I'm kind of doing a dairy free, but I have sour, like dairy protein free. So have you had an experience with that? Perhaps, you know, titrating in something like sour cream, but if I have whole cream, then I tend to get a little bit of a dairy response, but not so much with the sour cream for me. Yep. The fermentation probably is key there that, um, yeah, you're, and the proteins are also more broken down. Um, and it, it's a different animal. It's a totally different animal. So, and you're Italian, so you're probably lactose intolerant as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I can tolerate that. I mean, but if I have Greek yogurt or something like that, but I mean, sour cream basically makes ketogenic diets possible for me because that's how I meet my, my fat macros. Yeah. And for me, it's, it's, I love to whip cream. I, I love to have a bowl of organic, heavy whipped cream at the end of the day, just by itself. I don't put anything in it. I just love the whipped cream. I, I have to say something though, because, and, and Beth, I'm sure you've had patients like this because sometimes Dom um, and, and like, we all have our layers of how people can get away with keto and it doesn't always have to be the same for sure. But sometimes people will have 
they'll do that. They'll get to the end of the day. And you're kind of more saying, oh, it's calories, not necessarily ketones. And they'll get to the end of the day and like, oh, no, I need, you know, 40 more grams of fat. And then they'll fat load, which is going to bring their ketones up at that time. But the whole rest of the day when they had their protein and carbs, not with enough fat, their ketones probably went down, down, down because they didn't have the macros. We always try to get people to balance macros on a per meal basis as much as possible, not only thinking of per day. So <clears throat> just uh, so not to pick on what you're doing, but just sometimes that's a problem for people. They aren't getting, and especially too, when you're like, if you have bipolar versus you have, hey, I'm eating keto because of, you know, it depends why you're doing it as to how, how strict or how high we might be trying to get ketones for somebody. So it, for some people, he's like, that's fine. It's, you know, go with your totals. But then for when we're really trying to induce medical benefit and reduce, hopefully be it, get some to the point of reducing medications, we're really pushing for that macro on a per meal basis. So, I mean, my next meal will be like these wild planet sardines and they have, you know, extra virgin olive oil. And then I'll do my other half dose of a ketone supplement. So the macros may be like one to one, you know, keto, but then I kind of supplement maybe some MCT or a ketone supplement. So that's usually it's my in my diet's kind of protein heavy throughout the morning and afternoon, just maybe maybe one or two meals. And then I realize that I'm not I'm only got like a thousand calories, you know, by dinner time. So I have to make up my calories uh, just to maintain my weight, really. So that's how it kind of works for me. And I just uh, tend naturally not to be too hungry in the morning. So it does bring up uh, another question in regards to intermittent fasting. And for some patients, do you find that, or let's use the term, because uh, we just interviewed Dr. Uh, Sachin Panda, time-restricted feeding. That is that a lever that you will pull with your patients? And does it work? Uh, I've communicated quite a lot with Mike Dancer, and he uh, is adult, you know, patient that... Uh, has been quite successful in using this for like 15 years and he's down to just doing one meal a day and for seizure control he finds that's superior than spreading out his calories over several meals and i wonder if if what your experience with that is or if it's too restrictive for your patients yeah i'm all about whatever works and uh people are really pretty good to, at listening to their bodies once they get into a state of ketosis, I think, and get rid of the junk. I, and I, that's one of the benefits I tell them is like, you're going to be amazed at how differently you feel physically and mentally. It's taken you to this different level of humanity where you're really going to be more in tune to your body. And um, people kind of look at me like, what? what are you talking about? And then when they get there, like, yeah, I, I get it. I, I really, you know, I really feel like I can't eat three hours before I go to bed. It messes up my whole next day. Or I don't need to eat until one o'clock in the afternoon. I'm fine. So they they kind of figure those things out with a little bit of my prodding. And um, I just like to support that because if that works for you and you've been a good scientist and you've experimented a little bit, right, we can encourage them to be scientists and try things out because we know uh, what works for one person doesn't work for the next. But as long as they're doing things safely, I will say um, I don't always encourage people just to eat one meal because um, I have um, had some patients who have gotten into trouble metabolically with that, that it's just too much, I think, for their digestive tract, maybe their liver, and um, uh, they're, they're having problems digesting fat. You know, they're trying to be, I'm specifically talking about people being keto and it's just a big fat load for them to process within a short period of time. And so for that reason, I have people with any kind of um, gallbladder issue, digestion issue, actually eat smaller meals, maybe three meals seems, or two meals is pretty common, two meals and one little snack in between. And then, you know, it's seasonal too. That might be their winter diet. In the summer, they're back to just two meals or maybe four meals because they're really active. So it, it's got to shift with the seasons as well as, you know, the individual's needs. Yeah. I, and I, I tend to shy people away from one meal. Same thing. What, one, I worry that it's just the same thing that, that can you get enough in? And if you really eat, say you need 2000 calories, 
your body's not going to process and turn that all the ketones. A lot of that I think is going to go, and I have to you know, research it more, but I feel like a lot of that's going to go down to glucose and then maybe lower your ketones for a period of time and then bring them back up. You know, they'll come back up. So, I mean, I haven't done research on it, obviously, but I, I just think, ah, uh, and then I worry metabolically, are you going to slow down your metabolism and you're doing this? And then three years later, you try to eat, you know, you maybe you're eating a thousand calories. And now you try to eat 1500 and you start gaining weight. You know, I, I don't, I worry that some of those things might happen with people. Um, but again, if someone comes in and, and I have a friend of mine that's been doing this, you know, for years and she, I said, what, you only eat <laughs> one meal a day, really? And She's great. It, it's a, it works for her. It's not a it's not a um, therapeutic diet that she's doing. But I just was surprised. It was one of the first, you know, years ago that I heard someone doing that, and I thought, how can you just eat once a day? But again, she feels well on it. So, yeah, I just kind of, you know, would rather see a little bit. Oh, I know. I had another thought, and here it is. That with with ketosis, I mean, we can. Get you into ketosis, whether you eat three meals a day, three meals in a snack, two meals in a snack. You know, we can we can help manage it with the ratios and with the fat percentages to get people into a ketotic state using kind of the tools and tricks we have, without whatever food plan you want. So it's not, and again, intermittent fasting is great, but then I have some people, if they intermittent fast, they get to the end of the day, then they want it, then you eat too much because like, oh, I was gonna fast. And well, I gonna say. Yeah, confession here. Me too. And I'll think, oh, I'm going to fast. And I'll think, well, I'll just eat dinner. And then I just kind of keep eating because I'm just so hungry. I think, oh, I should have just waited till morning. And then I wouldn't have overeaten if I just wait till morning. And that'd be fine. So I, I think it's a real sensitivity. And we're working with people with eating disorders too. And so, you know, that we don't want to tell them to do intermittent fasting. And again, there are just so many reasons. So I, I have it in my educational materials. Definitely say, hey, here's something to talk about. But I don't, I don't personally use it as a standard. Like, okay, you're working with Denise, you're going to do a 16-8. No, I don't do that personally. The, the general consensus, and it, a little bit switching gears, but it ties into this, from the nutrition science perspective, and now we have a nutrition course that's a requirement for our medical students, and I'm part of faculty you know, leader in that, uh, making it mandatory. So from a very general perspective, um, nutritional interventions produce positive outcomes because it's improving overall metabolic health, right? Uh, insulin goes down, glycemic control uh, is better. And I want to ask you about continuous glucose monitoring, if that's something you want to use. But the overarching sort of idea behind the use of nutrition in medicine from the conventional point of view is that, well, all these benefits are, are coming about because you're losing weight, that improves metabolic health. And then, you know, insulin control and glycemic variability. And it kind of leads me to the question, like in patients that you're managing, do you see changes that are uh, independent of <clears throat> weight loss, I guess, or state another way, are the, are the outcomes that you're seeing correlated with or dependent upon that patient? having improved metabolic health, but also maybe improved like uh, a decrease in, in weight or fat mass or favorable body composition alterations, you know, from a scientific perspective. So, uh, but I know in the epilepsy world, you know, weight cannot be uh, generally you want, you don't want children to lose weight. So they will have seizure control independent of losing weight, obviously, but outside of the world of epilepsy, uh, because this is an ongoing question, I think, you know, that that is important to address when it comes to managing. Is it weight loss or <laughs> what's your experience? I'm I'm excited. You just made me think of something I need to um, add to my poster. So I have a poster I'm taking to the conference that's coming up next week. And it's two patients with bipolar one who have done fabulous with keto, basically, you know, almost, you know, one of them symptom free entirely. And one of them, um, let's say 90 to 95% symptom free. And this is going down to psychosis, hallucinations, depression to the point of, you know, suicidal attempts, um, focus, anxiety, you know, all the gamut of, of a bipolar one diagnosis. And, um, Neither of them had had weight loss. As a matter of fact, one of them, I she was eating so much MCT oil that we I said, "Whoa, you're gaining weight. <laughs> you better pull that back a little bit. I think you're overdoing the MCT oil." And so, yeah, neither of them had any had any weight loss. 
So that's one case. And then lots of other cases where um, there's no relationship because the people came in. People always, this is a super common question. I'm sure Beth had a million times. People come in and say, I had someone just email the other day. Can you work with skinny people? I don't want to lose weight. Like, oh, we've got you covered. You know, if this isn't, and I tell them, like, this isn't necessarily a weight loss diet. This is a metabolic state. And we go right back to what you said about children. These children, almost all of them have to gain weight. We keep them on their growth curve. If you feed enough calories on a ketogenic therapy, it's not a weight loss diet. And so, yeah, so absolutely. And But of course, we see all these benefits when people do lose weight. So yes, of course. And yes, we don't need, or no, we don't need weight loss just to do it. Yeah. I, aside from, I mean, if they need to lose weight, it's, it is a state that it's easier to lose weight because of the appetite control, particularly, um, people don't, people lose that carb craving on keto and even low carb. They just stop having this, I've got to eat, I've got to eat. I'm not really hungry, but I got to eat. That's, that's carb craving. And I try to identify that with people initially so that they recognize, are they really hungry? Are you, are you just looking for some carb to stuff in there and chew on? And um, so I think once they're in ketosis, they realize like, hmm, I feel like I could go hours. I, you know, and this is part of why people don't eat all day is like, they don't feel hungry, right? And as soon as they eat, then they get hungry, right? So, um, but if they eat a high fat meal, they're, they don't get as hungry because they get their ketones up. And that's something that we, we work on with people because it's, they feel, you know, people are still a little bit reticent about putting fat on their food um, just because it's been ingrained in our culture not to do that. Um, so, yeah, that, that's a, an excellent benefit. Um, you were asking about other benefits besides, um, you know, the, the, aside from the weight loss, aside from the epilepsy, the number one report I get about people going into ketosis is I have more energy. And often it's I wake up in the morning ready to get up, not sluggish. And I feel like I fall back to sleep, but I'm like, I'm ready to get up. And that's really something that keeps them going. Like this is a huge metabolic shift and, and they're, you know, makes them excited and engaged with the diet. So I love when that happens. Cause that's my like, ah, we got it. I, I got this one. This one's going to make it, you know, I'm, I'm going to see this one through because it's, I, it's really hard to project when I start working with people, who's going to be able to really do this and who's not. And it's not about how much money you have, because I had somebody who was very wealthy recently who couldn't do it. Even he had the money to hire a chef, have all the best foods in the world. He just couldn't do it. And I've had people with very little education and, and not much money who are able to do it with two and a fish, you know, and um, hot dogs <laughs> and eggs, which are the cheapest protein food. So it's it's amazing to see the spectrum of motivation and willingness, you know, and all that come together once people get into ketosis and and get going on this and just they get empowered by positive change in their their brain function that keeps them going. Yeah, I'm I'm really interested in to hear both of your opinions in the barrier to entry for, for example, like that patient who had a chef make his meals and everything. Was it the carbohydrate restriction? Did they not give it enough time to get the adaptations to feel better? And I think as a community and as we, you know, push this into platforms where you get CME credits and it's teaching how to do this, this barrier to entry seems like the big pushback. My, my sister is at the psych Congress, I guess right now in like Tennessee, it's like the biggest, it's like the AES, it's like the American epilepsy say, for, but for say, and, uh, and there's, there's someone speaking there like on ketogenic diets actually. Uh, and, but I think, you know, the pushback is that the barrier to entry is just so high. And, and how do we, uh, how do we address that? And in epilepsy, you guys were talking about a transition from just, well, eliminating the foods and then transitioning, but that's not really the conventional approach, but should it be? I mean, cause you guys are like specializing, there's a science and the art and you guys are really 
kind of artists in what you do and personalizing it to the patient. And I guess what we need to know is what are the major, the three big barriers to entry that we need to address for practitioners? Yes. Uh, so I would say one of the three ent uh, big barriers to entry is access to the food portion of the diet, right? The diet is 90% food. We could say the rest is supplements and fluids, but 90% of the ability to do the diet is access to ketogenic meals. And what are our options? We make it ourselves. We buy them pre-made. We have somebody make it for us, right? I mean, yeah, it is. Uh, and ketogenic, eating ketogenic can be more expensive, I guess. You know, I, I guess I would argue that. It's, it's all relative to what you were paying before. Uh, processed foods are more expensive than, than whole foods. And, and so there's a little bit of know-how. Like if you, if you buy uh, frozen foods and not prepackaged foods um, or buy in quantity and freeze things, there's ways to, to bring costs down. Um, but by and large, processed foods are more expensive than, than eating whole foods. And fats, Dominic, you're the, I remember a conversation with you years and years ago about fats being the cheapest food of all the macronutrients, right? Didn't it, didn't it come? Yeah, but calories. Um, so we're talking about a high-fat diet. Now, I would argue, okay, I want quality fat. I want extra virgin olive oil, not just olive oil. There's a huge difference in, difference in polyphenol content. There's actually a study coming out from Spain where they put... Uh, a group of people on extra virgin olive oil and a group on, they just gave them extra virgin olive oil, said use as much as you want. And the, the other group got just um, the uh, refined olive oil, you know, like the third filing of it, which doesn't have much poly polyphenol content. So, and they didn't know which was which, they just used it. And then they did blood work. And as one would expect, the extra virgin olive oil had the, the major benefits, but they were significant benefits, even lower glucose levels. So this is coming out soon. They had a preprint art, uh, article out recently, and, and I can't wait to get my hands on the real one because I'm a big believer in extra virgin olive oil in ketogenic diets for those polyphenols, which are antioxidants, and they support the gut microbiome. And we should be encouraging healthy fats on keto, not, not sunflower oil, not canola oil, which Unfortunately, a lot of the keto food companies are putting in as cheap fats, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and then so to piggyback or just, you know, say the second barrier, I think, is that people think they have to go full in keto to start. And I think as we, as we, you know, start training and, you know, or continue training with people is, is just helping them see that we're okay if you start with gluten-free and, and you start taking out processed foods and you start slowly. We're, we're okay with that. It takes longer. A lot of times people do want to just jump in with both feet because they just, they just want to do it and they don't want to you know, take the extra time because they could say, well, I've got to do two, three months of this and then I've got to do three more months of keto. So there's, there's that, but that's a personality you know, you know, issue or what, you know, that issue, but how, what you're used to, what might work for you, whether you're a slow mover or a fast mover. And so, and that takes me to, I think the third person or third thing would be access to trained clinicians, which that's something you, know, you guys are working on with training curriculum. We're working on with training curriculum and trying to continue to just get good quality education out. So more and more people, um, can, you know, have a good feel of what it's like to work with people. And partly you just have to, you, you train yourself and you start and, and you, know, you start and just continue to grow and learn because, you know, we all had a first day. That's a uh, really good, you know, perspective on this. I think we need to start with education, education first. And that's why I advocate and all of my students that work under me to, and, you know, uh, Angela Poff is kind of spearheading metabolic health initiative, the metabolic health summit. And then there's inks and global symposiums and keto live. I mean, it's amazing to see what has happened since we connected, you know, over a decade ago, all these things have been growing. Uh, one thing that another thing that has been growing significantly is monitoring technologies, wearables. 
like a uh, continuous glucose monitor, which, which I'm wearing now and continuous maybe ketone monitoring is on the horizon. I still have not been able to test that yet, but I uh, wanted to get your feedback on, you know, a CGM device, just as I think it was, it's an amazing device that if a patient was wearing it and the data went to the clinician, that they could basically monitor adherence to the ketogenic diet. Because if you're eating ketogenic, you're not going to see any significant postprandial excursions in gluc glucose at all. You know, you shouldn't. So, so there's that there. And I'm wondering if this is something that you use, if it becomes affordable, should, should all practitioners be using this in their patients? Yeah, I would start with let the practitioner try it first, because then they'll understand what their patients are going through, right? It's an excellent way for anybody who uh, is using keto uh, to, to really understand what goes in their mouth and how it affects their blood, whether it's carb, not enough fat, too much protein, right? Um, and I, I know you have been impressed with using it. I haven't used a CGM. I've uh, tested my glucose frequently enough where I practically use a CGM just to see impacts of different ketogenic ratios. Um, but I think it's an excellent tool. Um, I wish all my patients could start out with one. I don't think people need them forever, but I think because this is what happens is they get so, um, if, if they're compliant and if they're getting results, they usually are pretty compliant. But once they get going on this after about six weeks, they feel like my glucose is always the same every time. Like I don't even look anymore. Right. So they don't, you don't need it very long, but using it at the beginning is really helpful to get you through keto flu, which some people suffer from more severely than others. And, um, it could be helpful for that. Um, but it, I think it is sort of a putting a mirror up in front of you in terms of helping you with your diet too. Like you're not going to cheat <laughs> if you know your glucose is over a hundred and you've got a reading come on, coming up in 20 minutes. It just is like your best friend until you get going. So I strongly recommend them. Um, continuous ketone monitoring. I, I just learned from, um, uh, Mr. Mojo, that the current one that is being made in China is actually not super reliable. So I think that's off in the distance a little bit. But I, I'm more comfortable and I find the glucose actually sometimes more helpful than ketones because if someone's running really low on glucose, they just aren't getting enough calories. And, and so if I hear, you know, like, I was feeling really great. Now I'm just kind of like, I don't have any energy. What are your glucoses running? Oh, they're, they're great. They're in the sixties and seventies. Um, but my ketones are kind of low. Ah, uh, you know, this is a situation where somebody needs more energy, right? They're just not getting enough calories and they may be having had lost some weight or maybe stagnated in their weight. Cause now their body is like preserving calories, thinking it's starving. So I, I kind of find that glucose monitoring is more helpful sometimes and then ketones along because it tells me about those situations. And working now with eating disorders, I see, um, you know, I'm a little more worried about people with their weight, other conditions, not so much, but it, I, I just really, if I had to choose between cons uh, continuous glucose monitoring or continuous ketone monitoring, I'd go for the glucose. Um, because you know when glucose is in or within a range that they're going to have good ketones generally. Yeah. And it's the single most important metabolic biomarker. And if you can, you know, measure it in real time with a closed loop system that gi that's giving you feedback. And there's things outside of food too that could like exercise and stress and things like that. And I think it would be uh, very insightful from uh, from the perspective of managing psychiatric conditions too, to see correlations in glucose levels and the onset of symptoms and, and the management of symptoms. And, and I think that's a important, could be a very, I see it in myself, you know, that, uh, my mood is generally stable. Uh, we had a hurricane come through last week. We had intruders enter the house and at the same day, like I dislocated my shoulder and had to get every, like it all happened, like in a very compressed time frame. And then I went back and, and looked at my glucose levels during the, during that. And it was very interesting to see levels that I had otherwise not seen before. So like stress levels. and So yeah, cortisol, your cortisol goes up, your glucose goes up. We see that when people go into the hospital for surgery, 
you know, we always had to have an order in for keto patients when they come into the hospital for a procedure or a surgery that if their glucose falls below 50, there is this order that pops into the um, order set system that they get a certain amount of dextrose to keep it up. Well, no one ever uses that order because their glucose always goes up because they're stressed. Their body is stressed, right? So it's usually on the high end. So yeah, you experience the same thing. It's, it was just a different type of stress. People need to understand though, too, with glucose monitoring and always kind of trying to help them understand that, just saying that there are so many other things that can impact your glucose that, that are not food. And that can be really discouraging for them. And it's just, yeah, you had a bad day. You had a bad night's sleep. You got in a fight with somebody, an argument, you know, you, you, you have an intruder, a broken shoulder, you name it. So all these things can inf influence. So I think that's just part of the education so people know. But uh, I think the access to the monitors is frustrating unless, unless for something I don't know, you know, it requires a doctor's prescription to get a continuous glucose monitor. And so unless there's a brand or there's a way to get them that, that I don't know about. And so you have doctors saying, well, oh, well, you don't have, you know, you know, you don't have diabetes. You don't need a glucose monitor. And obviously people are getting them. And I've written letters for patients to get them, you know, where, you know, said, hey, they're on keto and da, 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 da. We monitor glucose. Please give this monitor. And so there are ways to get them. It's just, it would be nice. You can just go buy a, a glucose meter to poke your finger off the shelf. And, and so I'm a little confused as to why we can't just purchase those off the shelf. Yeah, there's a bit of regulatory, just in the US and Canada, you can buy them off the shelf. Um, but there's third party like Levels Health, for example, there's a third party telemedicine that can handle it, you know, pretty quickly with just filling out a form. Uh, but I think once the economy of scale and the price point comes down, these are going to be cheaper than the point of care finger prick devices, just because you'll get two weeks of data, continuous data, and, you know, probably be 25 to 40 bucks or something like that for like two weeks of continuous monitoring. And I think just wearing it for two to four weeks is so incredibly insightful and it helps you tweak your diet. And then once you tweak your diet over two to four weeks with a ketogenic, you know, periodically, I test so many different things. So it becomes very insightful to test different variations of the diet or ketone supplements or other things that would lower glucose, you know, so it's very helpful in that way. No, I think that's great. And and then when the you know, I, I'm, I'm also, well, I, I'm disappointed if it's going to take how much longer for the continuous ketone monitoring, but that's, you know, that's going to be great because there, we also, we sometimes have, and I'll, Beth has had these parents too, and these parents that will test ketones and glucose, you know, five, six times a day on their child because they're, you know, they're trying to keep them in a good range and they don't want them to have seizures and their seizures may be life-threatening. So there's absolutely good reason to do it and you do it in diabetes. So it's not as if it's, you know, um, harmful or hurt, you know, that hurtful or anything, but, but wow, to have that option. So they don't have to, you know, dilute the day with all these, all these finger pokes and they can get the data and that, but then some people, I worry that so much data also can take them just like woo, over the top. And, and that's just some people are, you know, to so much data nerds and, or that it can cause more stress for them. I think that's everybody knowing their boundaries. So maybe it's TMI and they need to pull back, but that's, you're going to have that with no matter what. Yeah. That's a possibility. Yeah. My colleague and I'm on her, she's studying eating disorders and basically using CGMs to see if you can predict eating behavior or disordered eating behavior in college students. So, uh, that study is ongoing now, um, uh, Dr. Diane Rancourt. So another thing, a conversation that needs to happen is just because I get it from other doctors who are probably listening is. How do we integrate these nutritional therapies with the standard of care? So if you have patients coming in who are on uh, atypical antidepressant or uh, psychotics, for example, and that cause weight gain or anti-epileptic drugs. So how do you begin to titrate and adjust the medication with the understanding that for like bipolar and depression, other, other things that the diet should be in people listening to this as an adjuvant, maybe at first, right? And then you can titrate the medication as you go. Um, and how do you approach that transition? And is that, do you have to work with the neurologist, with the psychiatrist, um, uh, to, to wean them off the drugs or to use them? Is there synergy with the drugs? I mean, 
we went to a conference, I think in Belgium, UCB Pharmaceuticals, Dr. Jung Ro was there, a lot of the clinicians and Kepra. And I think there was some discussion about Kepra's kind of synergizing with a ketogenic diet in a way that you could use a much smaller dose and get better results with either one alone if they're combined. So th does that happen in, in your eyes? Do you see this synergy or contraindications? So, so what we, we always have to fall back on, Hey, we're dietitians. We cannot make medication recommendations. And so we always will say that, but I'll say we, what well, we might, I might recommend that it's time to go talk to your doctor. So we always have to couch it with that because anything that I say would, you know, it's not, it's not a professional allowance that we have, but what we tend to see, and Beth can, you know, agree or disagree, but there's, is is that someone goes into ketosis very often, they might see more medication side effects because now you've changed your metabolism. Like you said, you don't, you may not need both or all of the above. And it would be great if we ever got to a point of saying, wow, to start keto, if you're on four medications, you know, maybe you should get down to three first, or maybe if you're on three, you should get down to two, or maybe you know, or maybe within four weeks of starting, you know, we need to wait, you know, there are just different things. The sooner someone has benefit, the sooner I think that they should talk to their doctor about decreasing a medication. If you, and I'll tell people, if you went, if you had, if your child had epilepsy and you went to Hopkins and you saw Eric, Dr. Kossoff, and he, they were doing better. In, and I don't put words in his mouth, but I've heard him speak about it. If they were doing better in six weeks at a visit, he might start tapering one of their medications. He might look at that and I hope I'm correct on the timing, but you know, within a relatively short period of time, if you're at different places, different neurologists, they will say you have to be seizure free before we taper your medicine. And, and that, and what I've learned from Beth over the years is, you know, less is more, less is more. So we're consistently seeing people seem to do better, you know, off this. And these are, these are our experiences, our case reports, our anecdotal reports, not so much studies, but there is at least one really good study. I think it's on Deuce syndrome, Beth, where, where they, they look and they say, oh, five medications, you have this benefit. This isn't, you know, epilepsy. Five medications, you have this benefit. You have more benefit with four. You have more benefit with three of the diet. You have more benefit, you know, so as the medications go down, the diet benefit improves. Relieving the side effects too. I mean, you're not, you got to take into consideration all these drugs that's, you know, polypharmacy is producing side effects. They get sleepy, you know, kids want to take naps during the day. And I know Mike Dancer was like, you know, he's just basically walking around like a zombie. He was telling me, so he's very adamantly opposed to using uh, anti-epileptic drugs. And, and I think the less medication you could use, I think we can all agree the less medication that we need to manage a disorder, the same thing with diabetes, right? The less insulin we can use to manage type two diabetes, if we could do it with a uh, diet. It is. And I, I want to add a caveat. There are some medications that need to be used with caution with keto. And I, I'm the one that's been the whistleblower in so many cases because, um, you know, I have to think about how often people see they're a specialist. It's for a neurologist. It's like once every six months, if you have epilepsy or migraine headache, the rest is like phone calls. Whereas I'm on the phone with them once a week and I'm hearing about uh, their progress. Uh, and so I've, I've really honed in on the problematic medications. And there's a class of anti-seizure drugs that's also used for migraine headaches. So I've seen this in a lot of adults with migraines. Um, and they're called carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. And they can cause acidosis. And when you combine that with a ketogenic diet, especially at the start, where you can be in a state of ketosis just by going into ketosis. And usually the body compensates very nicely for that, and that's very transient. But that in combination with one of these drugs can make somebody pretty lethargic. And um, even so much so that um, there's a doctor in Chicago who suggested to his colleagues, you got to cut down by at least 25% on a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor when you're putting patients on keto, because if you don't, you're going to have problems right away. Um, and I would even maintain that uh, on uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, um, seizures get better when they're completely off. So I've worked with a lot of people going to the neurologist saying, all right, this patient's migraines are much less frequent, but they're still suffer suffering from the cognitive side effects of 
Topamax, for example, which can dull your senses, and keto's making them brighter, but can we please start reducing this? And, and they'll ask, uh, you know, what's the, what's the um, proof that this can help? And I'll just say, I have lots of anecdotal proof. Do you want me to tell you about each patient? <laughs> I can do that over a phone call. It's going to take about an hour. And no, they don't want to hear all that. They'll just try it because they want me off their backs, right? So topamaxins and nisamide are two drugs that I have run into many times with epilepsy and migraine headache and even other neurological disorders that just need to be cautiously watched. Valproic acid is another one. Valproic acid uses carnitine to get into the mitochondria. So, so does fatty acids on keto. So we see there's competition. So this drug also has to be followed. So this is probably the most commonly used anti-seizure medication uh, out there that's being prescribed. And we have lots of patients who are on valproic acid when they start keto and they get very sleepy about a weekend and people want to stop keto. And now I'm uh, no enough to say, no, let's not stop keto. Let's reduce the medication. And by the way, we got to get carnitine on board supplementally to um, help them process both the diet and, and the medication. So that's, a, that's a, a stick that I just won't put down because I've just seen so many people suffer through that before I really figured out what the situation was. And any any feedback for psychiatric disorders? I mean, you have just a huge amount of experience with epilepsy and, uh, you know, for uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, I think acetazolamide, Diamox. As far as with psychiatric, though, I mean, kind of, I mean, feel like it's the same thing. I've had a couple of people fail on the diet and I've, and I've said what well, you're you're on four medications and it, it, and that I don't, think, I don't think the diet can get through. You know, I, I just don't think we're, we're getting there and that's probably a problem and you'd need to talk to your doctor. And it's a very scary situation for them to be willing to do that. But we also try to explain to the patient or the physician that when you add on ketogenic therapy, it's, you're adding on a medication. It is a treatment. It's a therapy. It's metabolically impacting them. And so it would be, I think, perfectly logical to titrate down, you know, one thing, if especially if there's a problematic medication, you know, early on, if they were on several things, it would be reasonable to look at doing that because you're adding a med. Because if you were going to add on a different seizure med or psychiatric med, very often they would taper one while they're increasing the next one. So it wouldn't be out of line to do that. And I've heard Chris Palmer say, you know, suggest that over three seizure meds, he doesn't think the diet is going to be effective in those so, you know, I'm kind of holding on to that and I've seen some in experience. And so the one person that I, one of the two that I mentioned and the poster that I'm doing, she's still on several um, seizure medications, but at the start of her diet, her doctor actually took her off four medications, different things. Um, right when she started within the first couple of weeks and I was terrified, I thought, oh my goodness, that's, that's a lot of, um, a lot of change going on metabolically. Uh, she did fine. She did fine. But also her, she was closely managed by her psychiatrist. Like for medications, if you don't mind mentioning what they are, what, what is the advantage to stacking them? I could see like a, an atypical and maybe a small dose of a typical, di you know, uh, antipsychotic and maybe an antidepressant or something. Like, are you talking about different drug classes? Like when you remove four medications? This person, it was several different drug classes. It wasn't for antipsychotics. It was, I mean, they were, they actually removed metformin, which I wouldn't have done. I would have left metformin. Um, but, and then again, I, I'd have to look at that specifically, but it, it was not all for antipsychotics. It was just, she was just severely over medicated. I believe she was on probably eight or nine medications at the start. And thankfully, you know, he looked at this and said, this is, you know, and I think she'd been recently hospitalized and, you know, probably sometimes things get added on, added on in a, in a crisis situation. Yeah. And then I'm just, and this is just a fun fact about that particular person, if I can tell uh, kind of an interesting story about her. So she, after about three months on the diet and we were doing a very specific diet, she wanted that. And after about three months, like I've had enough of this, this is great. You know, I can't do this anymore. And I said, ah, stop, stop measuring your food, send me pictures. So we just totally did a pivot. She stopped being so precise. And we just talked about what her food looked like. She sent me beautiful pictures of her meals. And so that was great. 
But then she traveled all over the world, literally went all over the world, did great. And then she went to New York and I don't know what happened, but she went off keto and, and she was doing fabulous. Went off keto for a whole long weekend. And even then when she got home, she was still off keto. So off, I believe a total of eight or nine days. And she, she said, every symptom came back. Everything came back. And she didn't, she almost got hospitalized. Her family was able to get her back on the diet after about five days she started feeling better. So they were able to manage this. And then after two weeks, she was 80% better. After four weeks, she was at 90%. Now she's, she's really good. And, and what she told me was that she said, this would have taken three to six months if I had been hospitalized and been put on all the medications to get from where I was to where I am today, months and months. And then, and then just fun fact, I spoke to her last week and she said, and I, saw where she was at. It wasn't her house. And she said, Oh, I'm in the hospital. And I thought, Oh, oh no, you're in the hospital. And she said her family member was in the hospital and she was visiting. And she said, I'm being the adult here in this situation. I've never done that before. It's always me on the other side. It's always me in the bed. And here she got to, to be there and be the helper for, for her family member. So it was very cool. The recovery that you mentioned reminds me of like the post ictal phase when a patient would have like a epilepsy would have a seizure and they snap out of it pretty quickly if they're on a ketogenic diet, if they have a breakthrough seizure. So it kind of reminded me of that. Um, so, so I, I've talked to a number of different friends and colleagues and in, in psychiatry and, and maybe this is what they say, well, this approach looks, you know, highly relevant. And I think there's a lot of good science behind it. The theory makes a lot of sense, but my patients wouldn't do this. And I have them managed fairly well on, on drug therapies. So that's like, I mean, almost like the ubiquitous kind of feedback that I get when I reach out and I don't try to, you know, proselytize or, or try to really push it in a way. It's like, hey, have you considered this with your patients? And it's just like, thanks, but no thanks, but it makes a lot of sense. But no, you don't understand. Our, psychiatric patients, bipolar depression, they're not going to follow this kind of therapy. And, uh, and, you know, and from their perspective, maybe not the patient perspective, it's like, we got things under control with, with drug therapy. So, and I know, you know, it's not for everybody, but what would you say to doc? Cause I do think that's a bit of a, a barrier to breaking in and for example, presenting at psych con Congress, which is going on now in Tennessee, like a massive, huge, convention where all the psychiatry it's mostly drug sponsored but what would you say to you know doctors that that would say that or just ignore it altogether I, I don't think we should ignore it but i think i think there needs to be a conversation here yes um so you know what it comes down to is choice an educated choice that adults make, but they have to be offered the options, right? And in healthcare, there is a big push, at least in my state, where whether you believe in it or not, you give the patients the options and they, they determine the choice based on their abilities. Um, so I've always said that with keto, it's like, doctor, it's not your choice. You have to tell them, you know, this is, a, this is an option. You can pick this or we can do drugs or maybe we can do surgery. Surgery is going to take like three months to get a workup, yada, yada. Drugs, we can start right now. Keto, you got to go see the dietitian. And, um, and then, you know, the dietitian will probably be your main, the main person that you're going to be connected with. Those are choices. But let's not shroud that with your opinion of what's going to be best for them. Because uh, let me tell you, and Denise has heard this too, I don't know how many doctors have told patients of mine, whether they're pediatric or adult, you can do keto, but it might kill you. You might get heart disease. You know, that's the kind of option they give them. Well, who's going to further look into it. And I've had people that tell me we would have tried this years ago, but this is what the doctor said and we were scared, right? So don't scare them off. Give them the option. Let them do some homework and you give them some resources too. Resources can be the Charlie Foundation, 
Matthew's Friends. There's there's lots of organizations now that are putting information out. I think Charlie Foundation might be the oldest, and I'm connected to them, so that that's the one I know the best. Denise and I do training uh, for um, nutritionists primarily, but we have other health providers that take our keto mastery courses. Georgia Eid does uh, training for psychiatrists and other health professionals. So those are some name dropping now. And, and Dom, I know you've got some of these in your blogs to mention, but there are resources. You know, and the, the best the best doctors are those that have tried it themselves. I, and I, God bless them. You know, there, there have been so many that have been non-believers and then they get hit with a, a medical kind of crisis, whether it's, you know, they, they've developed insulin resistance is usually what happens. Um, they're overweight, they've got insulin resistance, high blood pressure comes, and um, <laughs> they try first low carb and they may go keto and they're like, oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> and then they want to do it for their patients. So those, you know, those are what I think are the, the best practitioners, those that find it themselves and then become believers. Yeah. One, one thing, and here, here's my, so my commentary on this is with the physicians and we're trying to convince them. And, and like Beth said, you know, please leave your opinions at the door. And, and also sometimes people will look at someone and they'll say, well, they can't do it. Or yes, they have bipolar, they have this, or they're, they're in psychosis, they can't do it. Well, it depends on their support system. It depends on their determination. It depends on so many things. So it's really unfair to, as a clinician, you don't walk in their shoes. You don't know their life. You don't, you don't know. And, and so to make that determination for them is really, you know, inappropriate and unfair. And the other thing is, as, as I was researching for um, something, uh, um, a talk, uh, I realized and looked up and it said 10 to 20% of all medications prescribed are prescribed off label. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. People are always like, well, keto is not proven. There's no evidence. There's no evidence or not enough evidence. I'm like, wait a minute. We're prescribing, the doctors are prescribing off-label off medications consistently. And if, I, I mean, and for schizophrenia and bipolar, there are very few on-label medications. These are all late medications that are used off-label, or many of them, um, for these conditions. So already we're treating them with, with, with something that wasn't prescribed for, you know, or proven and through randomized control trials to treat these conditions. And I don't know the numbers on all those, but I know that they're a lot. So, and anyway, so when we look at that and we say, and they try to, you know, say we, you know, you're off label with keto. Well, you're off label with half the meds the patients are on. And there's, again, the evidence is growing and a lot of, yes, a lot of it's anecdotal and we're working on case studies and we're working on research, but it's compelling enough. And I tell people, I said, you know, ethically as a human and ethically and as a, as a dietitian, I am, I'm seeing too many results almost to not do this. I would almost feel uh, wrong to not be trying to help people, to know, to have something and, uh, you know, like to put your light under a bushel, so to speak, like the Bible says, you know, to, to, to not give this information, I, I, I would feel guilty. I would feel wrong. And those off-label medications have serious side effects. You know, ketogenic diets have manageable, you know, side effects and could be serious, but very minimal. Yeah. Maybe you can share with our listeners here the resources that you have and the platforms and educational platforms. And we're developing the Metabolic Health Initiative and, uh, you know, the Metabolic Health Summit and creating with ACCME certification. So you can get medical education credits, you know, with that accreditation. Uh, but I think it's super important because, I mean, what you guys are doing, obviously, I mean, you're in the trenches helping patients, but you're also massive advocates of this. And hopefully steering more general practitioners or just practitioners that are using conventional approaches to consider this as an option. And I think that that conversation needs to happen. And it's a, it's an ongoing conversation. It's not going to happen overnight as you both know, but, but what can we do? What are the platforms that you could advocate for and recommend and for our listeners out there? Well, so our keto mastery courses, which is uh, an async we do, we present live and also it's asynchronous. And so there are um, two levels of that. There's a foundational course, and that's what, 20 hours? Um, and there is a 20 education hours, and there's a, an advanced course that goes over keto. The foundational includes epilepsy. And then the advanced course goes into um, migraines and pregnancy and psychiatric and all, all those conditions. 
And then starting November 1st, you know, funny you ask, we are presenting a more, um, a modified course, more um, condensed course for psychiatric only, which will present that in November. So that'll be coming out. Um, and then go, if you want to add to that, Beth. So ketomastery.pro, charliefoundation.org. This, this is the little commercial here. Um, Metabolic Health Summit, you, Dom, your website has a vast volume of helpful blogs and information. That's a great place for people to, to get going too. So these are great um, quality education uh, resources that you can get started on. And um, we'd love to see you at a conference um, and help you get going. Yeah. And the, uh, also the inks society too, the global symposium and the inks and that's coming up, but, uh, I actually have a study section and I can't attend that. I know Angela and Victoria will be there, but, uh, but that has been a growing, you know, society and, um, uh, and then keto live too, which was an amazing event in Switzerland. Uh, Josephina is doing a great job with that. Uh, and then of course, yeah, got to plug MHS, which will be in January, 2024. Uh, but this, you know, these didn't really exist. Global Symposium did, but it was under a different name 10 years ago. But it's been amazing to see all these different conferences come up and the different practitioners. And uh, from a scientific perspective, the the sheer number of PubMed publications, peer reviewed publications. And if you go on clinicaltrials.gov, too, over the years, seeing that the number of clinical trials. And I think that's going to be super important to validate this for the expanding applications as was done with epilepsy. Yeah, it's, it's exciting. It's definitely grassroots and, uh, but growing because it continues to be effective and keto has been around for over a hundred years now. And the, no one can deny that it's not safe when well formulated and managed medically. So I, I have to add those caveats to it. We really don't want people doing this on their own um, because they can get into trouble. 